Greetings everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Districting and Redistricting, What I Have Learned So Far. My name is Chad and I'll be your host today. I'm joined by our panelist, Dino Trawick, City of Fort Smith Utilities GIS Manager and Chair of the Arkansas GIS Users Forum, Jamie Nash, Natural Resources Specialist Biologist, NRCS, and Secretary of the Arkansas GIS Users Forum, Sharon Hawkins, RDOT GIS and Mapping Administrator and Chair of the Arkansas GIS Board, Brian Culpepper, Senior Research Assistant at CAST, University of Arkansas, Daryl Allen, the City of Hope GIS and Technology Coordinator, Linda DeMassey, Senior GIS GPS Manager at RDOT, Sonny Farmahan, the Senior Transportation Planner at RDOT, Cody Massery, GIS Analyst, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, and Rusty McAllister, the GIS Coordinator at the City of Jonesboro. If at any time during today's presentation you have a question, please feel free to use the Q&A option at the bottom of your Zoom control screen. You can post those questions at any time and all of your questions will be answered at the end of today's broadcast. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Stephanie Shaw with the Northwest Arkansas Regional Planning Commission to present Districting and Redistricting, What I Have Learned So Far. Stephanie, we'll turn things over to you. Good afternoon and fellow user, user forum members. Um, I know most of you are prob probably like me and working on a project with this webinar running the sidelines, so thank you for joining today. Uh, you may not be responsible for redistricting that right now, but you could be when the next census rolls around. The fol folks at the Arkansas GIS Users Forum are always uh, recording the webinar, so it may be uh, good to note this and keep it in your pocket for future reference. Um, you, may, you may also be wondering why waffles. Uh, I tend to speak in metaphors and waffles come to mind when I'm working on redistricting. And I'll leave you to ponder that as we go through the webinar. Um, I'm sure you will start to understand um, where the waffles fit in as we move along. So redistricting is the process um, with which election districts are drawn or redrawn to ensure compliance with the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Um, districting and redistricting are kind of used interchangeably in, in some um, circles. Um, so as an analyst, one of the first questions I ask when getting a project is, how much time do I have to get it done and when's it due? Uh, when the census data uh, came out four months late, uh, that caused kind of a rush on redistricting. Um, I'm told that regional planning would normally have waited until the state, house, and senate districts had been drawn before starting school districts, but due to the time crunch, uh, we're doing this at the same time instead of in series. Um, some dates to remember. Um, December 1st is when the, is the deadline for the County Board of Election Commissioners to approve school zones. January 3rd is the deadline for the uh, County Board of Election Commissioners to establish the quorum court uh, districts or the Justice of the Peace districts. And March 25th or 60 days before an election is when um, precincts need to be established. Um, as far as wards, uh, it kind of depends on if you have a mayor council form of government or a city administrator or city manager form of government. Um, and the key there is you want it well before the filing period begins. Um, so if uh, the election is uh, May 24th, um, you want to make sure that you get it done at least you, maybe 60 days before the election, at least 30 days before the uh, filing period begins. Um, so that the people that are running know where their zone is. So is redistricting required? Um, this uh, map 
that I got from uh, Shelby Johnson uh, was used in the uh, the meeting at the uh, County Board of Election Commissioners, their regional meeting. Um, and it just kind of gives you an idea of those areas that will more than likely need to redistrict. Any of those that are in the dark blue areas that have had large growth or in the, the um, dark red areas that have had um, decrease uh, in population. So what's the law? Um, as far as the law goes, I am not a lawyer, nor have I ever played one on TV. Um, and so this will just be some um, information that I've gotten from my director, uh, Jeff Hawkins uh, at Regional Planning here, um, that he has put together, that has held up in the court in the past um, and gives us some general guidelines of um, what can help um, prevent some of those challenges um, to uh, redistricting, uh, legal challenges. So the authority given to the cities you can find in the uh, Arkansas, uh, in the ACA um, for uh, class one cities, it would be under 14-43-311. And for class two cities, it would be 14-44-102. So you can learn a little bit more about what the law actually says um, on redistricting. Um, this one for wards, for example, for example. Uh, so here are some of the um, principles to help reduce those legal challenges in redistricting. Uh, first, you want to make sure that you comply with the one person, one vote um, principle. Districts must be of substantially equal population. Um, what, uh, what we've been using is 10% um, plus or minus the mean um, for, the, for the district. That, that seems to be um, suitable um, for, for the definition of substantially equal. Um, we also want to make sure that we're complying with the Voter Rights Act of 1965, um, that uh, any practice or procedure um, that has a discriminatory effect on race or language mi minorities is minimized. Um, Districts must be geogra geographically contiguous, so we don't want islands. Um, we also want it to be geographically compact. Um, we, wanna, we want to shoot for a circle or a square, although we'll probably never get a circle or square as we're drawing these. We minimize splitting political subdivisions, um, preserve the uh, core of existing districts, maintain uh, continuity of representation, maintain communities of interest, and minimize partisan gerrymandering. And we'll talk a little bit more of that, about each one of those as we're going through. So who is responsible for what? Uh, congressional districts are, um, the state legislator, legislator is responsible for the uh, congressional districts, the State Board of Apportionment is responsible for the State House and Senate districts. Um, the County Board of Election uh, Commissioners is responsible for the uh, Quorum Court districts. And on the school districts, the School District Board of Directors needs to approve and also the County Board of Election Commissioners um, needs to approve the school zones. And the City Council will, would uh, approve the wards. So um, this is kind of the process. Uh, first, uh, we found the data, um, which uh, you may already know, but the, uh, the uh, redistricting data from the census for the 2020 decennial census uh, is the PL 94-171 files. Um, and you can get that as a packet. 
Um, the state GIS office has also um, packaged these and got this ready for uh, just the state of Arkansas. And you can find the data um, there also. So there were a couple of tool choices. Um, there's the districting tool for ArcMap. And there's the redistricting tool for ArcGIS Online. They're so close, uh, close in name, it's, it's easy to get them confused. But I have the links here where you can find those. Um, the main difference, well, I, I didn't really play with redistricting. Uh, I didn't download a free trial, but it was cost prohibitive for us. So we're using uh, the free toolbar. Uh, extension that is available for ArcMap. Um, and it's it's kind of a manually, it's a manual districting if you've ever done supervised and unsupervised classification of imagery. Um, it would be more like a supervised assignment. Um, with redistricting, um, believe that there's some automated features um, in that tool and you can do some supervised and under unsupervised assignment. And it has some additional functionality and sharing capabilities. Um, but for our needs and um, our budget, we went with uh, the districting for ArcMap, which is a fairly old tool. It's been around for quite a while. Um, it uses a personal geo databases. Um, I think that's a mix of what works best with the census data and the tool has just been around for a while. Um, so the first thing you'll do is you'll go into uh, ArcMap, open up just a blank uh, MXD and um, your toolbar will be located at the top of your, uh, of the top of ArcMap uh, up in the ribbon where it usually, where all the other toolbars are. And uh, you'll click on districting and you will create a plan. So there's a couple of different parts to the plan. There's the MXD itself. Um, there's the personal geo database that's created. And then each individual plan um, that, you can, that you'll create. Uh, so you... Um, input, as far as um, the input, when you, when you get to the first, I'm sorry, so we're going to create the plan and then our next step, um, we're going to click on this source geography uh, has attribute table data. And when you do, you're going to get this warning message that pops up and just click OK and you can go right through it. And now we want to um, we want to tell it what, what data we're using. Um, so our source geography data is going to be the blocks. Um, I'll mention right here, um, if you, for instance, if I'm working in Bittenville, I'd want the Bitten County blocks. Um, that's what I would pull in um, because the school district is uh, for Bittenville is all inside of Bitten County. Uh, for Siloam Springs, that is in Bitten in Washington counties. And so I'd want to bring in my blocks as um, that would cover the areas for Bitten and Washington counties. You can only bring in the blocks once, so you wouldn't want to add Bitten County and then go back and add Washington County. You, you want to bring the data in uh, with the minimum size you need to deal with. Uh, I looked at uh, school districts in uh, a different county. Um, and so when I'm pulling, when I was looking at the whole uh, state of Arkansas blocks, uh, it was very slow and overwhelming. So you don't want to pull in more data than you really have to. And um, it makes you put in a name for everything. So you'll have to just fill in a name. Um, as far as next step, in the creation, we're gonna have the, uh, it's gonna create the geo database for storing the plan. 
Um, we added our source data and this place our, our blocks. And then we need to set the number of divisions um, that they call districts. They call everything a district, whether it's a ward, um, you can choose the caption, but um, they call everything a district. So a district zone can almost be inter used interchangeably as you're going through this. Um, for school districts, we'd have um, five or seven. Um, and if a school district has a five single member zones and two members at large, that would be still five zones. When I was working on Bentonville, um, they wanted a plan that um, showed their existing seven zones, but then they're also considering doing five zones. You'd have to create two separate workspaces for that because when we're setting it up, it's all dependent on uh, your total population and your number of districts, zones, um, and then that will give you your optimal value. And your optimal value is just the mean um, as an integer value. It has to be, it's an integer. So um, also once we get through this step, there is a, there's one more step and it asks you, do you want to sum or uh, do you want to do any summing for any other of the fields that you have in this block layer? Uh, I highly recommend you check them all. Um, it won't take up that much space and you can delete everything later once plans are adopted. Um, because initially we were looking at uh, reporting just minority, um, so total population and the minority percent for, for each one of those zones. And um, then with House Bill 1975, it really wants a breakdown of races. Um, so we had to go back in and add in all of those fields. And it's easier just to add in all the fields and you can always delete them later. Okay, and so, so once you've added in all those fields, as the plan is uh, created, um, the information will be added to your table of contents. And then you can add any ancillary data like water, roads, voting districts, anything that will just help you draw those districts out. So if you are uh, redistricting because zones previously exist, existed, you can draw the existing zones that were adopted the first time. Um, so basically you're taking the shape from, um, that was created based on the 2010 census and you're overlaying it with the population for the 2020, uh, the total population for 2020. So you can see how far out of balance everything is. If um, all of your zones are within um, 10% or you know, plus or minus um, uh, 5% of the mean, um, then um, you, you may not need to redistrict unless the city just wants, wants it redistrict for some reason. Um, I have, we haven't found any in Bitten and Washington counties that were, that did not require redistricting just due to growth. And then we would repeat the, the drawings and calculations for additional plan versions. So I'll give you an idea of kind of what it looks like. Um, this is just kind of the dumbed down. I didn't add any, um, any extra data just so you could, see what's going on. Um, the, the symbology tool, I mean, you can go in and you know right click on it, go to your symbology. Um, it's a little quirky and slow. Um, it tends to, uh, when it first displays all of your colors, I have these bright colors in my table of contents. They have really pale colors that are hard to see. So the first thing I do is go in and change those. Um, it's helpful to um, maybe have a symbology file that you can uh, import so you don't have to do this multiple times if you're doing as much re redistricting as we are. Um, and it's also helpful to label your blocks with the total population, um, which is your P002001 field. Um, 
just it makes it a whole lot easier when you're trying to count through. And you want to try and keep this uh, MXD only for drawing the plans. Um, you can one, once the plan is drawn, you can get additional information. You can open up up in Pro, um, remembering that you can never bring it back once you've opened it in Pro. Uh, what I did is I did each one of my plans in its own uh, plan MXD, and then I created a new uh, MXD where I did all the mapping of every one of the plants that we used um, because it was so much easier. Because every time you create a plan, it wipes out anything that was in an MXD that you were looking at. It closes that and opens up a new one. Um, so you can select one block or many blocks. And um, as I've selected here on the left, on the right, you can see that it's start already starting to draw um, that district one. So I just go up to my toolbar, click on districts, start editing, and then uh, tell it where I want it to assign it to. Um, if I've got five, I'll have five districts plus one that's called unassigned uh, for this particular one. And it, um, it gives me the population um, right off. So I know uh, how much more I need to grab. Um, so here is, this is uh, Bentonville. This was a seven zone plan um, for their school districts. And um, this is kind of what it looks like. We tried to follow uh, highways uh, as much as possible or major roadways uh, were, were the main things that we would follow there. And you can see the population um, for each one of those districts. You can count it up and make sure you didn't miss a block somewhere. Um, I, uh, we were talking about uh, redistricting and using this tool at our um, Northwest Arkansas um, GIS meeting. And um, somebody in Fayetteville mentioned that um, the undo tool uh, was causing them problems where this statistic table wasn't opening. Um, so I would highly recommend that you use the districting toolbar as much as possible. You can use the clear, um, clear selected, but um, some of the other tools within ArcMap um, kind of affect the functionality of that toolbar. So you want to make sure that you don't use undo, rather just reassign it. So if you put too many in five and you need to move them to seven, um, then just change your assignment from, uh, I wanna move this to seven and select those areas that are in five and it'll reassign it. And as you can see, five is going to decrease. It has uses its red color for decreasing population and um, the increased population that was reassigned is gonna be in blue. Um, so um, my director is pretty amazing um, when he's going through all this, this block stuff. He asked me to draw him block maps and he was manually going in and counting all of those, um, which works great for small school districts, um, but not so, great for very large school districts, but coming up with great totals. Um, so we're starting from blocks and ultimately um, ending with a map um, that they can uh, use to um, see where, where their um, boards are located. We also do a map that shows where their board members are located um, just for their internal use. And then once they've adopted it, uh, they can just attach this one to an ordinance or a resolution. So some of the challenges have been um, this was uh, Farmington. Um, I'm, I'm working on redistricting also with uh, Christina Scarlott uh, in my office. We're the two that are working on redistricting and she worked primarily in Washington County and I've worked primarily in uh, Benton County but she had a really fun one where the uh, in Farmington School District they were 
right there in the same census block. Uh, so we have two board members that are really close together. Um, we try and um, we try and keep um, a plan um, that, if possible, you know, keeps keeps the current uh, board member locations um, intact. And then we do another um, for where we're just kind of cleaning up boundaries and following roads better. And we give them a, a, a couple of different versions um, to choose from. Um, but this is one of our one of our problemed areas. So we have nobody um, in zone five and we have two board, board members in zone two. Um, here's another example of close proximity. Um, there are three little dots in here, um, West Fork. As you can see, the Southern area in West Fork, there are no board members. And that seems to be a commonality that most of the board members are living closer into town. And then the more rural areas of the school district um, don't have um, anybody running out there. So um, that, that kind of puts our dots even closer together. Um, census blocks with odd shapes. This is in my town of uh, Bella Vista. In Bella Vista, we have a lot of um, POA property that surrounds houses. Um, so on the left, this block is 764, has 764 people in it, um, but that doesn't include this 1764, this 28, uh, even to get to some sort of semi-regular shape. And um, the one on the right is immediately adjacent to, to this other block. So uh, it can cause um, selecting greater population than you, than you actually intended. Uh, and this shape happened to be on the existing boundary between the election districts in, uh, for, between election districts one and two for Northwest Arkansas Community College. So um, that really changed how the shape was um, drawn. It doesn't, it doesn't really look like um, the last census did. Um, we, we have these hard to describe boundaries in newly annexed areas. What do we do on those when um, the, uh, this picture is in Fayetteville? And there's 297 people in this block that extends over the road and all into a, a totally different zone. Um, and so in those cases, um, we have to use housing units. Um, we have to use the housing unit fields from the H1 table, um, along with imagery, building footprints, 911 addresses, to identify those uh, residential housing units. Um, so we'll take our census blocks for the existing city limits, and then we'll use the, uh, the table, the H1 table um, from the census to calculate persons per housing unit. And then that will be used um, for newly annexed areas or anytime we have to split lots. And then, um, then we would add those populations together to get the total population. Um, extremely out of balance growth. Uh, when I was going along, uh, and the, the, the highest uh, deviation from the mean that I had seen was in Rogers and it was about 30%. And then I started working on Bentonville. Um, so once I, overlaid my um, previous zones with the uh, current population, uh, we found 80.8% deviation from the mean. Um, there, was, there, was, there, there had to be a lot of rebalancing. So my goal was uh, to get seven districts to have the populations between 15,000 and about 16 and a half thousand. Um, so that we would be within that 10% of the mean. Um, this was complicated by finding an easy way to describe the boundaries. Um, so sometimes it was 
um, split based on old township lines. Um, we really want to use highways, arterial routes, um, streams, major streams, lakes, if possible. So those large blocks um, were, there were large blocks surrounding what I call donut holes. Um, those just high population uh, spots that have um, this really unusual um, block shape that surrounds them. So we needed to prevent um, splitting it. We also wanted to try and prevent splitting of neighborhoods too. So um, here, that was the Fayetteville um, arm that came off that block. And that's kind of where it was located if you're um, curious about that. Another problem was uh, board member locations. Um, sometimes we get the board members listed by PO box. Um, other times um, there was that, just that proximity to other board members in, in, a, in the same zone or in other zones. Um, no address change that was submitted to the county clerk. So the county clerk had different um, information than the school board did. Uh, we may have had wrong or missing addresses on the school board's website. Um, and board members, um, oh, I had a couple of board members provide their work address instead of their home address, um, probably so they didn't get bugged at home. Um, but it's really important that we have their um, residential address because that is uh, crucial to whether or not they're allowed to be in that zone. Oh, and one more case, uh, we had a school district that had a person living in zone five, but representing zone one, uh, which was on the other side of the district. Um, they actually had to call the State Board of Education and ask for permission to do that because they couldn't get anybody to um, run for zone one. Um, so they were allowed to do it until um, somebody else decided to run. So that, that one was fun trying to figure out how do I how do I map that one and make it um, make that person represent their area when they don't live in it? Um, so some guidelines, um, again, follow, follow the major roads, streams, lakes, center lines, existing voting districts when possible, and try to use the same boundaries when redistricting wards as you used for school districts um, so that you're not getting little slivers when we get down to precincts. Uh, try to keep the shape as compact as possible. Contact your county clerk to seek um, input. Um, and they may say, oh, well, we already have um, um, the JP district that's going to be running down this way. Maybe we want to um, use that same line if possible. Um, and create a new plan for each area, a new plan workspace for each area. Um, you'll want to limit limit the census block area you uh, import into the plan. That's if your own, if the school district, for instance, is only in Benton County, only, only select Benton County blocks. Um, you don't wanna pull in more blocks than you have to. Keep good documentation for the next census and in case your methodology or your results are ever questioned, if it ever goes to court, um, you have good documentation on um, what you did and why you did what you did. Um, try not to split those blocks, except in very rare cases. Um, try not to assign more than one member to a zone um, unless they're at large. Um, try not to use the undo button um, that's in ArcMap. Instead, use the reassign. Um, avoid hook shapes and districts that wrap around each other. And don't forget about changes that have happened in your county since the last census. Uh, for wards, uh, we look at the census population um, to get started, but we're also gonna include anything that's been annexed since those, um, those shapes were submitted in 2019 um, because wards, wards are forever, just forever changing. Um, as far as progress, we have completed 10 school districts for redistricting, uh, six school districts for first time districting. 
Uh, we still have much to do. Uh, we have one school district that needs an alternate plan. Actually, I think I just finished that one this morning <clears throat> before this uh, webinar. And then we still have JP districts to do for Benton and Washington counties. Um, the wards, uh, we, we take every city in our uh, in Benton and Washington counties that's, that's part of our member group from the uh, Regional Planning Commission. Um, we do a review of their wards just to see where they're at right now and give them, a, give them an idea of whether they'll need to um, redistrict those wards or not. And then we still, uh, and then we will help uh, Washington County with precincts. Um, so the, the county clerks, um, they are the real superheroes of redistricting. Um, I say that because they're responsible for gathering all the voter information for each of those precincts and ensuring anything um, that needs to change um, is sent back to each one of those voters so that um, their ballot will be correct uh, when it's time to vote. Uh, and they'll make tens of thousands of changes depending on how the legislature districts, school zones, wards, et cetera, are drawn. Um, we want, and this is where following common boundaries uh, can ease the workload of the county clerk when we get, when we get to precincts. And that brings me back to the lawful. Um, precincts are the shapes that remain when all districts, all redistricting has been completed. So I think of, you know, a stack. Uh, so one waffle is um, maybe school districts. Another waffle is wards. Another waffle is um, the Senate districts. Another one is uh, house districts. Uh, and so when you lay all those waffles on top of them, top of each other, every time you make a cut and you make another cut um, for, you make a, a JP district line, that's a cut. And you make a, a ward line, that's a cut. Um, all, all that's left, this, this pile of oddly shaped uh, waffle pieces, those are each precincts. Um, and so the uh, county clerk will have to look at all of those pieces and figure out which ones have changed, um, which, will, we, which we try and help with that. But, um, they have to look at those changes so that they can make all of these updates um, to all the voter um, information. So this is why um, developing a plan for selecting blocks, like um, we may wanna follow an interstate, um, try, try, and, try and do your split on the west and east side of this interstate uh, and developing a plan for splitting blocks, um, like using, using the housing units and only um, splitting blocks when absolutely, when there's absolutely no other way to come up with a, um, a reasonable shape um, can all be really, really helpful to, um, to your county clerk. So that's pretty much all I have. Do um, you have any questions? I'd be happy to answer what I can. All right. Thanks so much, Stephanie. It was an absolutely wonderful presentation. Uh, I can't say enough how much I appreciate the info. Uh, admittedly, I was hoping to find some way I could uh, get out of paying less property tax through this, but maybe next time. <laughs> All right. So we'll, uh, we'll open things up for questions. Uh, we've had a few submitted in the Q&A, I believe. So let's go back to those. Um, and you may have answered at least a couple of these already. Uh, looks like the first one here, I believe that's pronounced Hans. Uh, how do you handle block splits if an existing boundary used a 2010 census block that is not present in the 2020 block data? Yeah, so that's, um, and that's how we're handling it is. Um, we look at let's let's say we have a um, a block that has a hundred people in it, and it just happens to have let's say ten houses, and four of those houses are uh, in zone one, and and six of those houses are in zone two. So we take our total population, um, 
and divide that um, using the H1 table um, from the census. We had to pull that in separately um, to get our um, total housing units and then divide that um, so that we get our persons per housing unit and then use that factor um, times the number of houses um, in that houses in that area, not to be confused with just um, commercial or um, churches or other things. We want to make sure that they're actually residential units. Okay, great. Uh, it looks like you might have answered this uh, next question in, in actually one of your last slides on your progress report, but James asked, uh, Stephanie, have you been working on City of Bentonville wards redistricting? We, we have not got to wards yet. Um, we're um, finishing up the school districts. Um, we will be doing one, uh, we will be doing the Asylum Springs wards early. Um, based on their form of government, they'll just need that um, sooner than anybody else in Benton and Washington counties. Um, but wards are coming. Uh, we just have not started on them yet. Uh, one other thing I would mention, uh, we did find out that um, Springdale decided to use a third party. Um, and there may be some other others out there that are using 30, third party um, companies to do the redistricting. Uh, if you're in Benton, Washington counties and you're using a third party, hey, that's great. That's that's your choice. Um, but if you'll just let us know, because we're working on your uh, your data um, and we're working on your plans. So um, no need to do double work if we don't have to. So it looks like next, uh, maybe a couple of comments from, from I believe it's Hans. Uh, one was cul-de-sacs are the brain of redistricting. <laughs> I find that a little humorous. I live in a cul-de-sac. Uh, and then uh, do feel housing units are accurate in the census to estimate population. Uh, him speaking, we have found housing units in the right of way of the interstate. <laughs> so uh, that was interesting. Uh, and then we actually uh, found some housing units. Um, we were looking at an area outside of um, Northwest Arkansas, and there were nine persons showing in the, um, like in between the ramps on the interstate. And that can be uh, census noise that we can't do a whole lot about. Interesting. So one final question here from Sam. Uh, will the final product be posted on the NWARP website or the GIS office site? Yes. So um, what, what we're doing is we have had two. So far, we've only had two uh, school districts adopt um, a plan. Um, they're, they're all still looking at them. It's pretty early. Um, and once we find out um, which plan is adopted by which city, um, we'll put that all into a feature class and we'll send it up to um, the state GIS office for them to be able to um, put together with, with um, all the other um, counties in the state. And so that next year they have, I mean, next census, and uh, for the future, they have um, accurate data that we've, we've scrubbed for them. All right. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Stephanie, for that. So it looks like all of the questions in the Q&A have been answered. Um, if you guys have any more, feel free to post those now. In the meantime, we'll, we'll open things up to our panelists if you guys have anything you'd like to add to the conversation. <clears throat> I'll, I'll just go ahead and say it's very interesting. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate your time and, and especially all the work that you do on this. I mean, it's, it's a lot going on and y'all definitely have your hands full right now as, as well as other organizations doing redistricting. All right. Thanks for that. And and uh, Christina Scartlot has, uh, has worked just as hard as I have on all of this. Um, so I want to definitely she didn't want to do a webinar, but uh, she's uh, she's worked really hard on this. So I want to make sure that uh, I recognize her. 
All right. Thank you for that, Dino. And, and once again, thank you, Stephanie, for your presentation today. Uh, so just a couple more announcements here as we wrap things up. So coming up next month, it's that time of year once again to celebrate GIS Day. Uh, we would remind everyone to tune in to our next webinar event that will actually take place on GIS Day, uh, November 17th. That's next month. Uh, so we'll be making announcements regarding our content and presentations to come very, very soon. Uh, actually, Stephanie mentioned in her onset that this webinar, as well as many others, have been recorded. All of that content is available on the Arkansas GIS Users Forum YouTube page. Uh, we would encourage you to go there to view that content and most of all, subscribe to our page. Uh, we need more subscribers to reach a certain level of, of content capability. So thank you guys for that. That being said, that will conclude today's webinar. Thank you again, Stephanie. Thank you again to all of our panelists and thank you again to all the attendees who participated today. We hope you have a great rest of the day.